Good, well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to Downing College in Cambridge and to the Axon Johnson Centre for the Study of Classical Architecture here at the University of Cambridge. I'm Frank Salmon, I'm the director of the centre. It's a great pleasure to welcome those of you who are in the room today, uh, and also to welcome very much those of you who are joining us online. And perhaps briefly before we start this afternoon's proceedings, I would just like to apologize to anybody who was either in the room who was listening last week online or wishing to listen last week online to our seminar, which for a technical reason did not live stream. But the recording of last week's presentation is now on our uh, website, on our YouTube site. Uh, so if you'd like to catch up the last week's seminar, you can find it there. And once again, my apologies that the technical issue meant that uh, it didn't live stream last week. So uh, we have a, a first uh, for this fourth seminar of our Lent term 2023, which is we've got a double act today uh, of um, Paul Davis uh, and David Hensall. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Gill, uh, to chair the session. So Rebecca, over to you and welcome to our speakers. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, so today's uh, session is going to take form of more of a conversation uh, with questions coming um, from myself. And then at the end, we'll open up to the floor for more questions. Um, but first of all, to introduce our two speakers, we have um, Paul Davis, Professor Emerita um, in History of Art from the University of Reading, and uh, Dr. David Hensel, who is reader in the Department of History of Art at the University of Birmingham. Now, many of you might be very familiar with Paul and David. They have, over the years, uh, created this amazing body of scholarship by working in partnership together in a way that's probably quite um, unusual um, amongst our um, scholars. But between the two of them, they have produced some amazing um, contributions to the field of um, architectural history, particularly in relation to um, Italian Renaissance architectural history. Um, together, of course, they published the, uh, their book on Michele San Michele. And um, more recently, they also oh, previous to that, they published um, the Paper Museum of um, Cassiano del Pozzo, producing the volume of the architectural drawings from the later Renaissance period. And that work of cataloguing uh, drawings has perhaps led to where they are today, which is working on a major catalogue of the Codex Conair, um, which is the topic of our talk today. So with a lot of material to cover, I'm going to pass um, straight on uh, to our speakers and ask um, the first question of today, which is, what is the Codex Conair? <laughs> Well, there you see two, two drawings on the screen. Um, on the left is the Basilica of Maxentius, and on the right is the Cortina del Belvedere. Um, what it consists of mainly, though, are early 16th century drawings of Rome's ancient monuments. Um, and it is very, very um, splendid. It was produced, we can, we can say now with some confidence, because it wasn't really clear before, this body of work, main body of work, was produced actually during the lifetime of um, Bramante, the great pioneering architect. Um, so there's the Tempietto on the left and um, St. Peter's as it now exists today on the right hand side. And um, as far as the Codex Conair is concerned, we can also say um, it is one of the most prized possessions of the Sir John Soane's Museum in London. When I say one of, if you ask them, they'll say it's their second most prized possession, the first being the sarcophagus of Seti I. So this book, which you, which you hardly ever see, because it's hidden away somewhere, is regarded by them as their second most prized possession, which makes it, makes, makes it um, something of great, um, uh, singularity. Um, so, so, and how did the um, uh, Soane Museum come to own this uh, codex? Well, it's a long road. Um, it was acquired by the um, antiquarian and collector Cassiano del Pozzo in the early 17th century. And it's still in its 17th century album binding which you see on the left and the spine is on the right. Um, on the far right, there's a page from the album and there's a seal at the bottom, which is the seal uh, of uh, a descendant of the Dal Pozzo family by the name of Ben Sony. And all the uh, albums and books of drawings that were collected in the paper museum as it's called, 
bear this seal on an early page. Um, well, how did it how did it get to um, um, where we are today? Um, <coughs> there it is. The picture on the left shows Cassiano del Pozzo's palace in Rome in the middle of the slide, and the picture on the right shows the Sir John Soane's museum. Um, it came from by a tortuous route from Cassiano de po del Pozzo and his palace to Robert Adam, first of all. And Robert Adam, with his brother James, bought uh, the drawing holdings of Cassiano del Pozzo's paper museum. But under mysterious circumstances, the Codex Conair and some other architectural books of drawings were separated out from the main body of work. And then a bit later on, uh, after the deaths of the Adam brothers, it came to uh, John Soane, who bought it at, at auction, which is why it is in the Soane Museum today. So how come it is so well known and such a famous collection? Well, I, guess, I, mean, I, I think there are probably uh, three main reasons. So. First of all, there's, we're looking at the Colosseum uh, on the left and some Doric capitals on the right. The first reason is to do with this very early date. So in the, in the scheme of things, if we look at 16th century drawings after the antique, there are a few books of drawings or individual drawings that are older than the Codex uh, Conair. So that's one main reason. The second reason to do is to do with the number and the sheer quality of the actual drawings. Uh, which were, interestingly, of sufficient merit or regarded as being so to be copied uh, by a, a whole load of them were copied very early on by Michelangelo. So here we're looking at a, um, at a drawing of the entablature of the Theatre of Marcellus in the Codex Conair, and on the right is uh, Michelangelo's copy of that drawing, and it's one of uh, well over 100 copy drawings that Michelangelo produced. And then the third reason is to do with this. Here's a much thumbed copy of an uh, early volume of the papers of the British School at Rome, um, which contains almost, uh, well, in fact, com completely, uh, it contains um, an enormous article written by Thomas Ashby, uh, which is a catalogue of the drawings which came out, as you can see, in 1904, and it's because of this um, publication that the Codex Conair became known to uh, scholars throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. So it had a sort of great deal of publicity as a result of Ashby's publication. Wonderful. So what can you tell us, Paul, about um, Ashby's uh, catalogue? Well, and maybe a few words first about Thomas Ashby himself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thomas Ashby was um, an archaeologist rather than an art historian. Um, born in 1874, um, he um, uh, studied um, the ruins of ancient Rome uh, first as assistant director in the British um, School in Rome, and then as director of the British School in Rome. Uh, and um, he, in terms of his approach to archaeology, um, he um, used uh, or saw the value of using Renaissance drawings as a means of understanding the past, um, helping him to determine um, or, or gain more information about the antiquities um, than by looking at the antiquities themselves. Um, so uh, the production of this particular catalogue came at a time when lots of archaeologists were beginning to use this approach. Um, so we see in the from the last decade of the um, 19th century through the end of the first decade of the 20th century, lots of facsimile uh, editions of um, Renaissance drawings appearing. So um, uh, we see ta the Taquino Senese, by Giuliano da Sangallo, published by Falb in 1899. We see uh, Herman Egger um, published the Codex Oscuriolensis 
1906, um, Christian Hulsen publishing the um, Codex Barberini in the Vatican in, 15, in 1910. And um, Ashby's book falls right in, in the middle of all that. So he's doing something that lots of archaeologists are, are doing uh, at that particular time. And the catalogue is amongst um, his principal publications. He's perhaps best known for his um, topographical dictionary of ancient Rome that he published with Plattner um, and that came out in, in 1929. But this is one of his most significant publications. Um, the entries that he wrote, uh, and you can see a, a page here, um, tell you, identify the antiquity, and they focus really on what um, the drawing can tell you about the antiquity. That's the principal um, focus. So when you look at uh, the Colosseum, um, he really often doesn't have a lot to say because the drawings are accurate um, representations of the building. And therefore, for example, number four on the page there, he says, Secunda Amphitheatri, um, second story of the Colosseum, no measurements. So that's all he needs to say. So he doesn't really elaborate much or discuss the drawing as a drawing in, in any detail. So following this catalogue then, was there anything else that needed uh, doing on the, uh, on the Codo? Well, as Paul has uh, pointed out to you, Ashby's interest was to do with um, the drawings and what they depicted. So he was much less interested in the, let's say, the history of Renaissance drawings or the history of Renaissance antiquarianism. Um, and he was certainly not interested at all in the typologies of books of drawings after the antique. And as we've also seen just now, some of the entries in the catalogue are extremely um, summary in nature, such as the ones on the Colosseum, which are of, among the most interesting drawings. Um, since the drawings didn't tell him much, um, didn't tell him too much that he didn't already know about the building. So, you know, if the drawing is of the building, that's all you need to say about it. Um, so, anyway, it is a very important publication, this. I don't want to imply otherwise. But despite the fundamental importance of the catalogue, Ashby still got various things wrong, such as his identification of the Codex Conair draftsman, because he thought it was someone by the name of um, Andreas Conair. And the reason he did so was that he looked at the spine. And you can see um, on the right, it says Architectura Civilis, um, Architectura Civile Conairi, um, and so on. I've probably got it wrong a bit, but basically he, he, there's, there's this word conary, which um, is picked up from the one of the drawings on the inside, and he assumed that the book of drawings was by somebody called Andreas uh, Conair. And this was a matter that nobody ever challenged, right through until the 1970s, when it was challenged by a German scholar called Tilman Budenzieg, who found um, a drawing in the Uffizi drawing. Rebecca, there it is, Uffizi on the right, Codex Conair on the left. They both show the entablature of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, and they show it in virtually identical ways. But what is remarkable about the Uffizi drawing on the right is that it bears inscriptions, one of which says, that the drawing was executed by someone called Bernardo de la Volpaia. And that's why people um, probably correctly attach this name to the Codex Conair. Wonderful. So what sort of book was this Codex then? Well, the, this is um, uh, a question that Ashby didn't ask and actually has been very rarely discussed since. Um, but, it, there is a likely answer. Um, there's been an unspoken uh, assumption in the literature that it was a sketchbook, a sketchbook designed for or intended for the draftsman's own use uh, as an architect, uh, sort of almost like a model book that he could 
uh, later employing his own designs. Um, and also that, like other sketchbooks, it was compiled over a period with drawings being added piecemeal um, as, as it occurred to uh, the architect to do so. But internal evidence suggests otherwise, um, that it was a completely different sort of book. Um, we know that it, we know, know that it was produced in a very very short period of time. Um, the dating evidence, and there's much of it in the book, um, is of two sorts. Um, we have um, actual dates associated with a number of the drawings. I'll show you one example here at the bottom. Uh, which is a letter that is included in the book, um, which bears the date of the 1st of September 1513, which you can see at the bottom and at the, right underneath it says it provides the um, signature of the man that wrote the letter and why the book, the codex is believed to be, uh, was at one time believed to have been drawn by Andrea, uh, Andrea Con Conair. Um, you see Andreas Corneris written there at the bottom. So there's that sort of dating, and the dates that we see throughout the book are either 1512 or 1513. Um, there are no other dates in the book whatsoever. The other sort of dating that we find is uh, associated with what is drawn um, rather than providing dates uh, as such. So what we see at the top of the screen is a drawing of a wellhead in the cloister of um, San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome that was designed by um, Antonio de Sangallo the Younger, um, executed by Simone Mosca, uh, and bears the arms of Julius II. Uh, who of course dies in 1513. So this is a, a drawing of an object that is um, 1513 or, or slightly earlier. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, wonderful. So who was it originally made for then? Well, the, uh, as we perhaps want to clarify, because it was made very quickly, um, it was presumably made for someone. Yeah. or um, it was executed on their behalf, who we might call the patron. So the question is, who would the patron be? So uh, on the left is the letter we looked a bit at a minute ago. Um, and it's all about making having a sundial made. And it comes from somebody called Andreas Conair, who was a humanist operating in Rome. And it faces, in the present arrangement, a drawing of an ancient sundial. So there is a question about um, what that drawing is doing in the Codex Conair and what the letter is doing in the Codex Conair. And the significance of the letter is not who it's from, but who it's addressed to. And you can see at the top, it's addressed to someone called uh, Magister Bernardo Rucellai, who was a very famous Florentine humanist. He was the brother-in-law of Lorenzo dei Medici. He was the uncle of Pope Leo X. And he had a deep interest in Rome's ancient heritage. So he is the likely patron of the Codex Conair. He also had a personal interest in architecture, which makes this all the more likely. And he also knew the Della Volpia family. Uh, and, um, his interest in antiquity is reflected particularly in um, a publication that he produced, which was finally published in the 18th century, which I'm showing on the right hand side. It's about the workings, the political uh, workings, and also the physical fabric of the city of Rome. So it's, this is absolutely Bernardo Rucellai's territory. And it seems likely that the work was made uh, for him, but the trouble was he died before it was completed. Well, this may I just add one other yeah. uh, small point. We also know that Bernardo Rucellai was interested not just in topographical matters, but in architecture itself. Um, because uh, back in 
1474, there's an exchange of letters between Lorenzo de' Medici and Bernardo Rucciolai, in which they're talking about drawings for a villa, uh, and probably Poggio Cayano, the famous Medici villa. Uh, and in one letter, Bernardo Rucciolai refers to a drawing that he has made himself uh, and sends it to Lorenzo, saying, this is my idea for a villa. If you think this is complete rubbish, um, ignore it. Um, well, that's a paraphrase. <laughs> um, what, uh, and we also know from the De Urbe himself, itself, that Bernardo in it refers to drawings of the antiquities that he's made himself. So he is somebody who's interested in recording antiquities in drawn form. Thank you. So um, why then is it in this 17th century binding that we see? Um, well, the original compilation uh, was reformatted by Cass Cassiano del Pozzo. Um, the, it, 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 the codex, it was a codex, that much we know from internal evidence, we'll come to that a little bit later on, um, was dismantled. Uh, its sheets were then um, separated, so cut along the stitching fold and mounted in um, a grand album. Um, having said that, um, and we, here we see that, that album, but when Cassiano first acquired the book, he didn't have any intention of doing this. Um, we know this because some of the um, drawings, uh, that's the next one, yeah, uh, such as this one on the left, which is the tomb of um, Gaius Publicius Bibulus, which is ne ne uh, close to the um, Vittorio Emanuele monument in Rome, um, is a 17th century drawing added by one of Cassiano del Pazzo's own artists on the paper that came from the original codex. So from this we can infer that when he acquired the book, um, there were some blank pages, and he decided to add drawings to it. And it was only subsequently that he had it um, dismantled and, and for, um, transformed into an album. Um, so why did he convert it from this smaller codex into an album? Well, presumably he did it um, to aggrandize it. Um, to make it conform with other grand volumes that he had in his collection, such as the Architectura Civilis album, which has the same name, but is now at Windsor. So he was um, trying to create uh, a body of work in a similar sort of format that would look good on the shelves. <laughs> um, so do we know what it looked like before it was recast in this album format? Uh, well, we do know quite a bit about that. The original format and organisation of the codices can, can be reconstructed. Um, we know that uh, it was a small object before, a sort of um, a quarto book. Um, you can tell that because although some of the pages have been cut down, quite a few of them still have their rounded edges um, from its original format. Uh, and um, we also know that it probably took the form of two books, two codices, um, because <laughs> of the folio numbering. And you can see that in the slide on the right, or image on the right. Um, and these are- That's the number 37, the 37 not the number 41. Yeah, 41 yeah. is the, um, the album, uh, well, it's the Ashby number. Um, we call it the Ashby number because the 41 uh, doesn't, or that number doesn't appear on every page. It only appears on those sides of the um, paper that have a drawing on them. Some are blank. Uh, and so um, there's a, a discrepancy between the numbers. The 37 that you see there uh, is the numbering that was almost certainly applied to the volume when it first came to Cassiano's, um, into Cassiano's hands. Um, 
Now, one question that bothered us was whether the numbering of the folios, uh, the 37 that we see there, corresponded to the original page sequence um, or whether it was applied subsequently. And we realized that we could check this um, to see how the pages were originally joined to each other um, by using light sheets and shining light through the back of the paper, we could analyze the paper structure. Uh, and that allowed us um, to match one sheet up with the, the other. Um, so as to, um, and you could do this by the, the watermarks are often divided. So you can see how they matched up. Uh, and also the chain lines, these lines that run through the paper just here. Um, do uh, vary uh, in width um, from page to page. And we know that there were eight different paper molds that went into the production of the paper that formed the book. So the structure of the bits of paper is different one. There are, there are at least eight different um, paper types within the book. And so this allowed us to confirm that the page or foliation of the book corresponded closely with um, the structure of the paper. Have I missed anything, David? Don't think so. Okay. It's all been clear. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, with a clear idea then of what it uh, looked like, are there any other observations <laughs> that you've been able to make? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, an, in, uh, an intriguing one is that there were quite a lot of missing pages. And so this is um, using the foliation sequence, you can determine which pages are no longer there. Um, and about a third of the, the total um, is, is, is missing. Um, and I think we can... Um, so just to clarify, this is a sequence that gets, starts off at 36 verso and it continues down to this. 45 recto. So yeah. that's, a, that's one sequence. And you can see within that uh, band, there are that many missing pages. Yeah. Um, I've, I've chosen one with quite a lot of missing pages, just to make the, the point of a sort of emphatic one. Um, so what happened, what seems to have happened is that when Cass Cassiano dismantled mm -hmm. the album, at that point, he discarded the missing blank pages. Now, there's a question here about whether these missing pages were blank or not. Could they have borne drawings? And we know at least one drawing that was, there's evidence that it was glued down onto another page. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, glued down onto another page and then removed. So, it's possible that some of these um, missing pages did have drawings on that were glued down and then they tried to separate them to put them into the album and they got destroyed in the process. So that's a possibility. But quite a lot of um, them were probably blank. And that is largely because um, the, the project, the commissioned book for Bernardo Ricciolo was almost never, certainly never completed. Um, we know that Bernardo Rucellai, the likely patron, dies on the 7th of October 1514, so a year into the project. Um, with the patron dead, uh, the funding would have dried up for the project. And this change in circumstances might well explain the difference between... Um, um, well, before I get on to that point, I just want to show you these two these slides. We see... Um, a complete page of bases on the right and on the left, just one base. These are on facing pages in the codex. And it's quite clear that um, the page on the left was to have had more bases. So we think from evidence like this, um, we have an, an um, incomplete, incomplete book. Um, so with the change in circumstances, um, goes a change in the nature of the book. It goes from being something that was intended as a commission to becoming, I think, or we think rather, a, ske <laughs> a sketchbook. And I think we can illustrate that with an image back up. 
Yes. Uh, on the left here, um, we see one of the drawings that was produced when it was a, a commission. Uh, and on the right, uh, a page which is probably post abandonment of the project, uh, where the drawings are laid out much more haphazardly uh, on the page. Uh, there's overlap, there's less system in the way that um, they're actually drawn, whereas, as we'll be coming on to in a moment, the drawings in the codex, uh, when it was a commission, were very systematically um, represented. Um, so we think that um, Delaval Pyre continued to add drawings um, to the book after the abandonment of this commission, but we also know that um, it was almost certainly complete by the time that Michelangelo copied it in the years around 1516 and 1517. Okay, so what do we know then about how it was made? Well, as already mentioned, all the folios are on the same paper. Um, they all bear the same watermark, uh, at least, or maybe I should say, for um, eight variations of the same paper, so that eight paper molds were being used. Um, so that, from that, one might be tempted to argue that um, the sketchbook was made or bought before the drawings were um, put into it. Um, but there is quite a bit of evidence to the contrary. Um, because the drawings, uh, 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 th there's evidence that the drawings were, were produced before binding took place. Now, one of the bits of evidence is um, the way in which they were drawn. So you've got a page here and you can see that the perspective of these um, images is very carefully worked out, which implies that you had to have the page, piece of paper on a flat table in order to, to draw it um, with this degree of accuracy. Um, so if you've actually got a, if you're trying to draw in a book uh, with even with a big rule, it's going to be flopping about all over the place. You're not going to get it get it right. So this is one bit of evidence, but there's more evidence still. Um, echo the next one. If you look at a drawing like this, this is of the bars of Diocletian, which crosses um, two pieces of, well, it's the, a double folio at the center of a gathering. Um, what you can see is that the um, horizontal lines running across the gathering are perfectly drawn. Um, I think there's a detail of that. Yes, we can see here. Had you tried to do that in a sketchbook that was already bound, you'd make a real mess going across the gap between the pages, um, or there'd be a, 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 um, a hiatus between the lines. Uh, so all this suggests that it was the pages were prepared, um, unbound with the intention of binding them, which also reinforces the idea that this was made as a commission and very carefully planned. So um, how then was the material organised? Well, um, well, the book was organised according to recognisable principles. Uh, plans and elevations um, were, so first of all, we have a series of plans, then we have elevations, uh, and that is followed. So we're moving from big, um, images of buildings, so images that represent the whole building, through down to details. So we move from plans to elevations, and then we move on to, uh, and this is a list of the way in which the book is, is structured. Um, from uh, elevations, we move to monumental columns and obelisks, then are down into details, Doric entablatures, other entablatures, impost pedicles, capital spaces, vases and other ornaments. Now it's not wholly systematic, um, there are anomalies in that, but that's the basic structure. And it may well be that um, it was, um, there was a slightly different plan for, you know, had it been finished as a commission, it might have looked rather different. Um, 
We also see that there are very careful groupings in the book. So there are often the details are grouped according to similarity of form. So we have on the left a page of Doric capitals, but they're not any Doric capital. Um, they're ornamented Doric capitals. So in producing the book, um, Bernardo Ricciolai and Bernardo della Volpaia were carefully assembling things that were of like type. And we can see on the right there a series of architraves, which are all um, quite lavishly decorated. Great. So was the um, original compilation exceptional in its ordinary? You no, know, this is when we get onto the sort of re remarkable aspects of the Codex Conair. So it is exceptional and in a number of particular respects. So first of all, you see in the drawings re really quite a remarkable degree of accuracy and objectivity in producing the drawings. Um, and um, you also see that it appears that the drawings are often based upon recently acquired data. So no one had ever drawn the art of Titus like this before. And what you see in the Codex uh, Conair drawing of it is a sort of account of the um, extent of the art, which was genuinely antique, and then an avoidance of bits of the arch which were not. Now, you can't quite understand this today because the arch has been rebuilt. So that's how the arch is today. But if we look at how the arch was um, before the 18th century, or in the 18th century and before, you can see it was very fragmentary. And you can see that what you see in the drawing is an account of this fragmentary nature. So you have the old bits and you studiously avoid um, putting in any parts of the structure which don't appear to be genuinely ancient. So that is one aspect, but then there are many, many, various other reasons why the Codex Conair is of uh, such significance, which we'll now look at. Uh, Okay, um, one of the other uh, exceptional things about the Codex Conair is the consistency adopted in the mode of representation. So if we look at the sequence of arches here, what you can see is that, um, uh, that they're all represented in the same way. Um, they're represented um, from seen from the right hand side, uh, as showing the front and part of the side uh, of the building. Um, and this is quite exceptional at the time. There was a, beforehand, it was um, drawings of buildings used a variety of modes of representation, but this is much more consistent. And the way he does it is to um, draw the front of the building um, as an orthogonal projection, which you see here. So all the horizontals um, are match up. Uh, and a parallel, but then to represent the rest of the building in perspective. So you have a mix of the orthogonal and the perspective in, in one drawing. And he does this consistently throughout um, the, the book. Um, he also tends to use a high viewpoint, um, which obviates the need to provide a, a plan. So from these drawings, you don't really need a, a, a plan um, uh, here because you can actually uh, read the plan more or less from, from the, uh, what is drawn on the page. Um, okay. We also see that um, he represents capitals from um, below. Uh, and bases always from above. So it, it, from a natural perspective of how one would look at a building. But he goes um, beyond that. He in, in devises ingenious ways to represent different levels of complexity in um, base design. So if we look at the top left-hand image, we see how he represents a base that is... Um, not decorated at all, um, so we just get the profile. 
Uh, on the next to it, on just to the right, we see uh, a base that isn't decorated, but it does have um, a fluted shaft. So he represents that coming forward and that he's consistently does when he knows about the, sh the shaft type, he'll represent it like that. And then if he's got decoration on the surface, you see the profile on the, re on the right, the decoration on the left, and that is sometimes combined if he knows about it with uh, what is known about the shaft as well. And he does this in a consistent way through, throughout the, well, at least the first stage of the book. Um, another thing that he, he does is he tries to maximize as much information in any one drawing uh, as he can. So in this view uh, drawing section through the Tempietto, um, what we see is a right hand side of the image, which doesn't, isn't, uh, so it's not a true section. It's not, it's not correct in a sense, because um, what you have is the left hand side of the drawing providing a section through um, a part of the building that is rotated through 15 degrees with respect to the right hand side of the drawing. So he's giving you two sections or two bits of the building, two slices um, at, at slightly different angles. And he also does this with the Pantheon various other buildings too. And then, well, finally, the, what the Codex Comair shows is someone who is engaging in an immensely methodological approach um, to the, his use of sources. Um, and you, time and time again, you see a process in the drawings of copying and improvement. So on the left is a Comair drawing, and on the right is a very similar drawing produced beforehand by Giuliano de San Gallo, which may or may not have been the actual source for the Codex Conair drawing. But what you see in the Codex Conair drawing are a series of various improvements that have been made to the San Gallo original. So you can see, for example, the pair of buttresses at the top and the way they're attached to the building isn't the same. Then halfway down the building, you can see these very big piers, which uh, separate the um, side wings from the central part of the building. Well, they're different. Those bits just there. And then um, at the bottom, above those round spaces, on the left, you can see there's a more worked out version of an interior compared to what you see on the right, which was what was provided in the San Gallo drawing. And what all this tends to show us is that um, somebody had been on site, perhaps Bernardo della Vampire, with the San Gallo drawing and a kind of criticized it and improved it in a series of respects, which are then incorporated into the Conair drawing. And then in the next slide, a slightly different point, here are two very similar drawings of the entablature of the theater of Marcellus. Um, one in the Codex Codair, which is immensely accurate, and then one in the uh, one by Giuliano de San Gallo, which really isn't. Just look at the way the capital is drawn, and also look at the way in which the underside of the cornice is out of alignment. So you have coffers above the triglyphs, and you have those pegs above the metamers, which is wrong, and that's put right. Um, so what has happened here is that the Codex Conair drafts than Bernardo de la Volpire has probably got hold of better information, but he's following a tried and tested format for the representation of the image to produce a very, very detailed and very comprehensive account of the antiquity as it is seen. Wonderful. So is there anything else that is significant about the Codex? Well, what you can say overall is that from our research, it can be demonstrated that the Codex Conair provides a really detailed record of a crude knowledge of Rome's ancient architecture in around 1513, 1514, that is in the lifetime of Bramante. It shows that the Codex Conair is different from other books of drawings, as this was a commission produced in a short span of time and not a sketchbook in which the drawings were 
accumulated over years. And it shows a, the state of knowledge, as it were, at a snapshot of time. So this represents a particular moment, a particular stage in archaeological discovery and investigation. And we can sort of illustrate this by way of just looking at a couple of buildings and their representation in the Codex Conair, um, beginning with the Colosseum. Okay, so here we see uh, an image of the Colosseum, the Codex Conair on the left, and uh, Crescent Taylor's um, representation of it uh, from their publication in the 19th century. And what's clear from the com making this comparison is, uh, and later, I mean, the Crescent Taylor is a very relatively accurate image, is that the Codex Conair, um, which was we know based on a survey undertaken in 1513, um, is uh, incredibly accurate in relation to other drawings of the day. So if we have the next one, um, the, this is a, a, a one from the uh, by, uh, by Giuliano de San Gallo from the Taquino Senese, and you can see that the oval there is produced by um, trying to join two half circles. It's a sort of almond shape uh, and is much less accurate than the one on the left. In the next one, um, the Codex Conair. Um, gets it very, very accurate. So that the two ends of the arena uh, were drawn using two um, circles that are separate from each other, as you see on the right. And the next one. But if you compare the Codex Conair, uh, which is here on the left, with later 16th century representations of um, the Colosseum, you can see it's far more accurate than the later ones. In the middle, we have Serlio, where you can see the two circles are drawn uh, in a way that interlocks, as like a sort of Venn diagram, uh, and are making the, um, the ends of the arena um, much less pointed. And you can see the same in the Palladio drawing on the far right, where you can just about make out the two circles here that overlap each other in much the same way. Uh, that Serlio does. So the Codex Conair um, is uh, a really important stage in the, the, the history of recording the Colosseum, um, and it gets it much more accurate uh, than do many subsequent architects. I think we should probably add that, I don't know whether we made it quite clear, it looks like the Codex Conair copies uh, an actual survey, which must have been undertaken by a vast workforce, that took place in about uh, 1513. Um, and just why people later on then got it wrong is a bit of a mystery, but uh, the, the Codex Conair certainly marks a watershed moment in understanding that particular building. Mm -hmm. And uh, likewise, you could say similar things about the Pantheon. So the Pantheon also was the subject to a rigorous measuring operation. So the drawings are filled with very precise measurements and the drawings then convey the building in very vivid ways, analytical ways. So you've got on the left, the combination of the front and the side to show the outside and on the right, you've got the section. Well, actually it's not a proper section because it's two bits of section which are joined together. But all in all, it really shows you the detail of the uh, way in which the building is actually configured, which is really unusual. And then, well, you might want to ask yourself, well, you know, how did how did the Codex Conair draftsman get to do his drawing like that? Because, as it's obviously the case, and what you see of the Codex Conair is not like your experience in real life of the building, where you only see a bit of it. Um, somehow it's been put together so you can understand the organization of the interior and you can also understand the configuration of the plan. So the whole thing has been very ingeniously thought out, um, partly in relation to previous drawings. So if we make a comparison between the Codex Conair on the left and an earlier drawing, 
in the Codex Escoriolensis. Um, well, there's a big difference in the way it's understood, but it's probably also worth pointing out that the Escoriolensis drawing is also very artificial, and you can see how at the bottom, there's a sort of straight line mostly. And then at the top, there are a series of curves of equal curvature. What you're getting in the Codex Coderre is a sort of variation on this, a series of curves of equal curvature, but trying to cover the entirety of the ground plan. Um, so you get a combination of the plan, the internal elevation, and also the section all thrown together into a single image. And then if we just go on one step further, you can see, well, it does bear some relationship between the way in which the building was conceived by earlier uh, draftsmen such as Francesco Di Giorgio. But one of the cunning plans in the Codex Codair version is that by having arcs of the same curvature, you can keep the heights, the vertical heights of elements in each stage of the interior constant. So you can sort of understand better the, um, the, the, um, the design of, let's say, the lower story of the uh, Pantheon interior. And then if we look at the, the next slide, um, so did they did, did these drawings um, have much historical impact? Though? Well, it, it's a, as, as we've said, it is a moment that we are witnessing in the Codex Conair drawings. So um, directly, they had an impact, and we see that in the copies that were made of them by uh, Michelangelo. But there's also this indirect um, impact, and the Conair drawings. Um, in what they record uh, are, of in, uh, are drawings of enormous ramifications. So getting things right was a, a priority, as you can see with this uh, drawing of the bars of Caracalla, where so much has got right compared with previous drawings. So if we compare the bars of Caracalla with what we understand the Car bars of Caracalla to be today, um, almost everything is right. I mean, there are bits that are unclear and unresolved, but generally speaking, everything is right. And if we look at the next slide, we're comparing Conex, Conair, Vaza Caracalla with Palladio, Vaza Caracalla. The point is that in the Conair drawing, the things were all got right, or so many of them were got right. And it's this sort of sense of objectivity and accuracy, which then, you see in later drawings such as Palladio's of the same monument. So this is another way of putting this, is the Codex Conair, among other things, is a kind of testament to the birth of modern day archeology. span Thank you, David. Um, now we don't have much time left, but um, very quickly, would you like to speak about what we're going, what this is going to result um, in with this research? Yes. the, the what will happen is now that we've almost finished the catalogue, it's going to be put online uh, in Sir John Soane's uh, museum on their website. Um, it will also be published as a book um, by Repols, we hope, which will have much more information in it, appendices and comparative uh, illustrations and so forth. And we're also hoping to, um, or in conjunction with the same museum, uh, put on an exhibition, which is going to be scheduled for 2025. Thank you both so much. Um, a wonderful insight to both the Codex, but also to how your minds work. Um, <laughs> Now, I've asked a lot of questions, so in the little bit of time that we have, I'd like to open up to it, to the floor. Yes, Amanda, please. Yes, there, there is one. There, 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 as you know, or may know from the St. Carl's so I'm doing a similar job, but likely later, on the St. Carl's Day, which is probably not the most fresh day, because the St. Carl's on the green flag gets converted, it's quite a unique system. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the questions that are being clearly preserving you are preserving me. <laughs> and, uh, and particularly, how 
it comes together, and therefore what the coat holds coats are. Now, I think so. I'm talking about the forensic analysis of the, of the doc of the volume. Yeah. Um, and I think you explained it very clearly. But for instance, this idea of drawing things on two pages mm -hmm. that one certainly even as nice as is there, you would expect a piece of paper flat on on on, on a flat surface. Apparently, in the of the book album, which is a similar mm -hmm. sort of uh, depth and, and, and size. Uh, you could actually, and I'm talking to a forensic uh, paper historian and bookbinder, do it on the volume itself, which alters mm -hmm. that completely. And in fact, insofar as my album is concerned, there is evidence that not only was it not found later in the 18th mm -hmm. century, as it was believed, as some seem suggested, uh, but, to, but basically it all went to the, to the shop. Bought this thing and, and put the thing and started drawing mm -hmm. on it yeah. in a kind of out of way going back and forth. So I'm just wondering was how much do you think it could because then maybe other bits and there are inserts in my album, mm -hmm. uh, and there's all sorts of inserts in any found um, thing of the period. Maybe then you can put things or you can remove something and but I just wonder how much you are persuaded as to which one is the correct one. Because, of course, if you go and buy a, mm -hmm. a clean thing and you start putting it together, you have to sort of do it with an order. You talk about yeah. times and you talk about cash, for instance. But all of that has to be preconceived in a way. It's not a sketchbook that you go about as it comes. And therefore, the scope changes. Uh, so that goes back to what was the point of this, and you brilliantly explained, and one expects this enormous amount of cost, not least because who was surveying all these things, and how was the information shared, and, and how much was Volpaya involved or not involved, mm -hmm. and did he do all the drawing himself? Yes, yeah, that much we do know. Yeah, the, yeah. They, so it, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, oh, okay, well, I don't know quite which bit to answer of all this, but you're right that these surveys required enormous numbers of people all acting under direction to get them done. I mean, you cannot survey the Colosseum accurately and in a semi-ruinous condition without an awful lot of people being involved. So this sort of throws open the prospect of, you know, who was doing the organisation and when, um, but there is an enormous workforce at St. Peter's who often have nothing to do. So you can, <laughs> you can <laughs> send them off somewhere else to do something. And then the other, the other point in all this is, um, uh, well, where was it produced? Under what circumstances? And it really has to be the case that it's produced uh, in or near a very large library of drawings. So you can sort of look up the Temple of Minerva Medica and you can sort of pull out a lot of drawings and say, oh, I quite like that one, I don't like that. And you can, you can uh, draw them all because it would be impossible for any individual to do that amount of measurement that you see in the Codex Conair. It's all been done before. Um, I, I, I don't know whether Paul and I would necessarily agree but I mean, I reckon, I reckon there's less on-site measurement than you, than you might expect. That most of the understanding comes from looking at drawings and other drawings and putting them together. I agree. Uh, uh, there's probably very little measurement that was done by Bernardo himself. Uh, for this particular project. That doesn't mean to say that he didn't do surveys of other buildings, because we have records of him doing surveys of buildings um, prior and post this. But um, for this particular project, I think mean, Dave is absolutely right. I completely agree. It's about acquiring a series of drawings, and we know that he had access to the Codex Barberini or something that looked very like the all drawings that were copied from the Codex Barberini or drawings that the Codex Barberini was based on. So he's he has all that at his fingertips. We know 
because one thing we didn't mention is that um, quite a lot of the drawings in the Book of Modern Buildings are associated with Antonio de San Gallo the Younger. Um, because they say they are. They say yeah. they are, they're named. Mm -hmm. so he, in fact, is the only person that is mentioned by architect and mentioned by name in the codex. Sometimes it's just ADS or something along those lines. Sometimes it's Antoni, because it's all, all the captions are in, in, in the Latin. Um, so he would have had access to all Antonio de San Gallo, the Younger's drawings of antiquities, and presumably because he um, uh, copied uh, drawings from his collection anyway. So I think that's pretty much how he acquired all the material. Thank you. A question online. Okay, go on then, Matt. Um, so this is from Giacomo Damiani, who asks, what is the relationship of the Codex to contemporary efforts to interpret the meaning of Vitruvius's uh, Skynographia, or, or, or more generally, contemporary efforts to think with, with Vitruvius, I suppose? I, I don't think he had a kind of uh, ideological um, burden that he was that he was being accompanied with. I mean, I just think he had a really canny understanding about how to represent buildings in the most effective way possible. Yeah. And the sorts of drawings, drawings he produces, which are often a bit like axonometrics, but they're not there. So, but, you know, they're, they're conceptual representations of buildings somehow from the side. Um, I don't think there's any any compelling reason to make a sort of humanist link between what Vitruvius described as a plan and a, an elevation or a, a, a view mm. in the treatise. He was, he was just showing the buildings to greatest effect in the most economical way possible. Okay, I'd like to yeah, yeah. add a little bit to, I agree with what David has just said, but I think you can also, that the mode of representation is designed to make the drawings accessible to non-architects. To our, uh, particularly to antiquarians who'd like to know about the building, but would find it might find it slightly difficult reading orthogonal drawings uh, and that sort of thing. So that if you look at the drawings, that you can read the building very very easily um, if you are a non-expert, and I think that is one of the the driving forces for his choice of representation. Thank you. So time for one more question, I think, Deborah. Um, do you think he had an influence on Raphael's letter to Leo X? This <laughs> well, <laughs> I know, that's a really interesting question. So, obvi yeah, okay, you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Ob obviously, we think yes. I mean, we, I mean, it, it's a sort of uncanny that this was being made for uh, mm -hmm. Leo's. Uncle, um, uncle, thank you, uncle-in-law. Well, yeah, Leo's nephew. Sorry, Leo's <laughs> nephew. And then <laughs> just a bit later on, um, Raphael embarks on a similar program mm -hmm. uh, for the Pope. So, I, I mean, I think people knew about this, and uh, the Codex Code was the thing to beat. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is Raphael. He's sort of got a good idea, and but he's working out how, in his mind about how it could be improved upon. Mm -hmm. I think I'm so I think it's got everything to do with the way Raphael thinks that an account of Rome should be produced. But there's no mention of Raphael in it. The, right. I mean, the person that the, the link is with Antonio de Sangallo the Younger, mm -hmm. um, who after all was uh, associated with the Bramante workshop. And um, so, I mean, it's it's up in the air. It's something that we've sort of talked about a lot to see if we could actually pin it down a little bit more. And we haven't been able to yet, um, unfortunately, but um, we'll continue to think about it. But in a sense, the, the, the Bernardo Rucelli hypothesis, it is only a hypothesis, but if it were true, it does, that does pin it down. And yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm very sorry, but we are, short on time so we're going to have to um, round up this more formal part um, of the day thank our speakers but I'm also hopeful that if there are questions amongst the audience you might get a, a moment to direct them uh, to Paul and David but let's thank our speakers once again and thank you all for coming